We're now ready to go to two dimensions. Um, you can actually go beyond two dimensions in Fourier, but we're going to stop here because things do get a little gnarly when you get into three dimensions, in particular with spherical harmonics. But since we're mostly interested in images, we're going to stop at two dimensions. But you should know that Fourier does go above that if you need be. So the first thing is, let's ask the same question as before. What does it mean to represent now an image? And again, well, let's do grayscale image. Of course, we can do each color channel separately, or we can just do the luminance channel, or we can do a grayscale version of an image. But now we're going to start with the grayscale image, f of x, y. So x, of course, are the columns in the image, y's are the rows, and f represents each pixel value there. And now what we want to ask is, what is the corresponding cosine basis in 2D? You may have never thought about that. We tend to think of the cosine and sine as an inherently one-dimensional quantity. But here's the 2D basis. Let me do the algebra first. Uh, the 2D basis is cosine omega kx plus omega ly plus phi kl. So notice I have a double sum here. There is a frequency in the horizontal direction. That's omega sub k. There is a frequency in the vertical direction. That's omega l. And then there's just an overall phase shift. These are so-called sinusoidal gratings. So let's look at a few of them. So here's one, for example, where there is a change in frequency in the horizontal direction, but not in the vertical direction. Um, here's one where I've increased that horizontal frequency, and I've increased it again. And now I've rotated. Um, so now there's a, there's a frequency in the vertical direction, but not in the horizontal direction. And then, of course, there's everything in between. So here are some diagonal ones where there's a, a frequency in the horizontal and the vertical. So think if we can go all the way back to here, think about this, these guys over here. And I can rotate them in plane by simply controlling the frequencies in the horizontal and in the vertical direction. And of course, I think this should be obvious, but if you take a slice through these things, you'll get a cosine, right? Of course. Um, that thing right there, the white is where it's 1, the black is where it's 0, and it just forms a cosine. So if you take a slice through this, you'll get a cosine. And of course, for these over here, if you take a slice in the vertical direction, you'll get a cosine, and so on and so forth. So that's the two-dimensional cosine, so-called sinusoidal gratings. Um, it looks very similar to before. Um, we've just got a double sum now because we're, we're summing over x and y. We've still got these frequencies, omega k, omega l, and we still have that phase term. And then, of course, there's an amplitude modulation right here, which just changes, in our case now, the brightness of the underlying basis. Now, we also have this annoying thing here where we have the phase term, which is dependent on the underlying image. And we want to get rid of that phase term because, again, we don't want our basis to be changing every time we uh, represent a different image. So we're going to play the same game with the trig identity. So let's, let's go there. Ah, let me just remind you again that that's the frequency, that's the phase term, and that's the amplitude. Same as um, in the 1D case. So we have the same problem. We have a non-fixed basis. So how do we fix it? Let's go back to our old friend, the trig identity. Cosine of the sum of two things is equal to the cosine of one times the cosine of the other minus the sine of one times the sine of the other. And now I can rewrite this 2D Fourier series um, like this. And what I've done is I've simply factored out the phase term. And since that's a constant, I've folded it into that A sub KL and B sub KL. And now I have a fixed pair of bases, cos and sine, that are only frequency modulated, but not phase modulated. So it is now a fixed basis, the same way we did in 1D. Good. Uh, these are, again, an orthonormal basis. So again, this is a statement that if you have an image that is periodic, first of all, what does it mean to be a periodic image? It means what happens on the edges are continuous. So if this goes down to zero on one edge, it has to have a value of zero on this edge. Same with top and bottom. So it, it, it assumes periodicity in the horizontal direction and in the vertical direction. By the way, that's almost never true in an image. So that's a little weird. We'll see in the exercise at the end of this how we deal with that. But that is an assumption. This is a statement. You can represent an image as a sum of scaled cosines and sines of varying frequency. Fine. How? The Fourier transform. So what does the Fourier transform tells you to do is what are those scalar values? 
And what they are is now a dot product, so now I have a double sum because I'm summing over all the rows and columns, of the image f of uv times the basis. And then the same thing for the b terms. It is the dot product between f and the sinusoid. And so if you go back and look at the 1D version of this, this is exactly the same thing. I'm just lugging around another dimension, um, which is the rows of the image instead of just thinking about a single row of an image. Good. So this is all the same as before. A little notationally heavy because we're lugging around these extra terms, but conceptually exactly the same idea. I want to write an image as a linear combination of those, four, of those sinusoidal gradings. We're lugging around two bases. It's a little annoying, the same way it was annoying in 1D, so we're going to combine them using the complex exponential. So here is the complex exponential representation. It's exactly the same thing. Um, we have uh, f of x, y is now a scaled version of a complex exponential where we have i omega kx plus omega ly, again, no phase term. And then we have the weight here is an inner product between the image and the complex exponential. That is a complex value as before. If this is a complex value, we can represent that in terms of magnitude and phase in the same way that we did um, with the 1D signal. So more or less everything works out the same as before. Um, it's just a little bit fussier because we're carrying around uh, two pieces of information. All right, so let's instantiate this. So the good news is when you go to compute Fourier transforms, you don't actually have to do the underlying math. I think it's important to see the underlying math because you should understand what's happening. But of course, Python in any modern language is going to hand you um, the Fourier uh, function. So please write some code to compute the log of the magnitude of the Fourier transform of a grayscale image. Okay, let's unpack that. You're going to take a grayscale image. You're going to compute the Fourier transform. You're going to compute the magnitude, which is the square root of the sum of the square of the real and the imaginary. The real, of course, corresponds to the cosine term. The imaginary corresponds to the sinusoidal term. And I'm asking you to take the log of that because the dynamic range on magnitude of Fourier transforms is huge, and the log will allow us to visualize it a little bit better. A couple of things. Um, uh, different ways of doing Fourier transforms in Python. I'm going to recommend that you use NumPy's FF2. Be careful. There is a 1D Fourier transform and a 2D Fourier transform. You, of course, want the 2D here. And one thing to note, and this is, I, this is sort of an artifact of when we represent images, we tend to put the origin in the top left corner. So when you compute the Fourier transform, it's going to put the origin in the top left corner, and you need to shift it back into the middle so you can clearly see the Fourier magnitude. So look up FFT shift. That'll tell you how to reorient the image, the, rather the magnitude of the Fourier transform, in order to get the origin uh, back to the center of the image, which just makes the visualization a little bit easier. All right, go ahead and give it a try, and then I'll show you my solution. All right, here's the code. It's actually only uh, really two lines of code and then some visualization. Let's import uh, matplotlib, uh, numpy, and fft. I'm going to load my image, which is already a grayscale image, so I don't have to convert it. Here's my Fourier transform. So little f is the image. I compute the 2D transform. I'm going to shift it, and then I'm going to compute the absolute value. The absolute value of a complex value is the magnitude, the square root of, the sum of the squares. I could have done this manually too. I could have taken the real and imaginary part, squared them, summed them, and take the square root. The abs function does that for me. And then this is just a little visualization. And notice that the log is right here. So I can look at the log. Let's go ahead and look to see what this looks like. Um, so let's see here. Um, this over here is the Fourier magnitude and without the log. And you can see that it looks, and there's maybe one little pixel in there. I can sort of see one pixel dead center. Where did everything go? Um, and the reason why you can't see anything is that that middle value is the so-called DC term. It is the mean of the image. It is the average of the image. And that's a really high number, big number. And then everything else are relatively small numbers. And so when we compute the log of the Fourier transform, you can see that the pattern underneath emerges. And what is this saying? Well, we've put the origin in the center of the image here. Um, and so that court, so near the center, we are talking about low frequencies, things that in the image are changing very slowly. And as we move outward from the center, we are talking about higher and higher frequencies. Now it's a two-dimensional. So along the horizontal axis are things that have higher horizontal frequency, which corresponds to vertical edges. 
because the frequency is changing in this direction. Along the vertical axis, we have things that are aligned this way, so we're talking about horizontal edges in the image. And what you notice here is a couple of things in this Fourier magnitude. One is that things tend to fall off as we move away from the center. Lots of low frequencies, not so much the high frequencies out here in the corner. That's pretty typical of natural images. But you also notice this very strong energy along the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, which suggests that there are very, very strong horizontal and vertical edges in the underlying image which if you go and look at that LJPEG image, it's not obvious that there is. If you took an image, for example, of a checkerboard, then you would expect these really strong vertical and horizontal edges corresponding to the energy here and over here. But we don't really see that in the image. And it, it turns out this is actually an artifact. And it's an artifact because remember I said that Fourier series assumes a periodic signal or a periodic image. The image is not periodic. As I ramp around from one edge to the other and from top to bottom, the image is not continuous. The values up here are not here, and it's created an artificial edge, which is why you're seeing that energy along the vertical and horizontal axes. And so practically what you have to do is you have to force your signal or your image to be periodic, and that's this version right here. So let's go through it. Same thing as before, import some libraries, load the image in, and now what I'm going to do is create what's called a Hanning Windows. There are many, many different types of windows you can do. You can do a Hamming window, a Hanning window, a Gaussian window. There's lots and lots of windows. And all they do is they have a, a value of one near the center of the image and fall off to zero um, by the edges. And the reason they do that is that if you multiply that window, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second, by the image, well then it's going to force the value to go to zero and it's going to force periodicity in the underlying image. So I'm going to create this window right here. I'm going to make um, the window uh, uh, a unit mean so I don't change the amplitude of the image. I don't want to multiply it or uh, by a value greater than 1 or less than 1. I'm going to compute the Fourier transform of the image times the window, compute the absolute value, and then display the log. So let's see what happens now. So now what happens is the image is over there, which is a windowed version of the Einstein image. And you notice something, first of all, it's really aggressive. Um, and that's because the fall off is pretty slow going to the edges. But now you notice in the log Fourier transform, those strong vertical and horizontal edges are gone along the, the, the canonical uh, uh, axes. And that was an artifact. And it's really, really important to get this right. Because if you're looking at the Fourier transform of an image and you don't do this kind of windowing, you're going to have artifacts in this Fourier magnitude that have nothing to do with the underlying content other than you violated the underlying periodicity assumption. Now the price to be paid here is I'm not taking the Fourier transform of the entire image. I've sort of, I've got this weird windowing where I'm only looking at the energy near the middle, but you don't really have a choice if you want to avoid these artificial artifacts. So that's what the Fourier transform looks like. This is a more accurate representation of the Fourier transform of the underlying image. Fourier analysis is incredibly powerful, and we're going to see examples of where this comes into play in various aspects of computer vision, but it's also a very powerful tool in um, audio processing, signal processing, image analysis, image processing. And in fact, we've sort of seen Fourier already. If we go all the way back to JPEG compression, when we were talking about discrete cosine transforms, we were representing little image patches, 8 by 8 blocks, in terms of the cosine, but not the sine. So it was in some ways a, an impoverished version of a Fourier. And the reason why it's impoverished, by the way, is it's more computationally efficient. Um, and again, there are assumptions in the DCT, which I never mentioned, but there's one of them. The assumption is that the blocks are periodic, which of course they are not. And that also is what leads to those blocking artifacts that we saw in the JPEG compression. The Fourier representation, like the DCT representation, is very powerful, and there are really lovely and beautiful and elegant links to convolution and linear time invariant systems that we're going to see um, for the next, uh, for, for a big part of the semester as we start to analyze and try to reason about information in an image.